Hello, everyone. Um, this is a little bit of a different talk than I normally do, but here what I'm trying to do, my overall goal is to communicate an idea. And in some sense, also try and develop a better way to talk about this idea. And so even if you, if you agree or disagree, or even if I'm unclear, uh, I really want to kind of have this be turn into a more of a conversation you know, afterwards and ongoing, because uh, this is kind of like a core concept that I'm not quite clear on the best way to talk about it is. So if there's any sort of way to improve this, uh, that's why I come, would ask of you. So what is this core issue? Um, the core issue is that I want to uh, look at things very much from this uh, developer perspective. You know, how do we make sure that uh, developers can continue to have like, the high speed of iteration that they want? Um, and how do we kind of focus on um, some of their needs as well. But let's go into a little bit of where I come from. Um, so I spent a lot of time uh, doing all sorts of weird things. Started off at Google, then went into the military, started building all sorts of interesting capabilities, got into cybersecurity, training our, our cyber teams, then went to digital service. This is where we kind of do a lot more uh, of the like review of existing projects, trying to kind of improve like software quality. Uh, uh, again, mainly in government and defense, became a consultant, became a contractor, and all throughout this process, I encountered a very common set of problems. Um, I usually kind of trim them down to be like, hey, it's, we have like networking problems, this is about connectivity, this is about distributed systems, this is about how do we uh, make sure that all the things are talking in the right way. Next big category of problem has tended to be mainly about users. I want to be able to manage users. I want to be able to authenticate them. I want to authorize them. I want to be able to uh, like control this and have set policies for these things. So it's very like, a, you know, I can condense it to say that this is about users and how do we manage them? How do we control them? How do we organize them? Um, sometimes these users are humans. Sometimes they happen to be machines or services, but still a very similar set of problems. Um, but then there's another category, and you know, those, are, those, are pro those are real problems to be solved, those are real problems to be addressed, but this last category is what I want to focus on today, is this category of, um, I call it packaging, but it's an idea of how do we make sure that we have all of our things that we need to, for our you know, software to run, or hell, maybe it's our hardware to run, but we need all these things for, for this to run, for it to be effective, we want to control it over time. This is a lot of uh, what the lot of talks have been uh, here today. And along the way, I encountered um, a set, uh, a thing that gives me a set of superpowers. Um, it's, uh, it's this tool called Nix, and I want to be able to bring this kind of tool that is either relatively unknown or not as uh, adoptable, but make it adoptable. Make those superpowers available to everyone, and uh, that's a company called Flocks that uh, I'm a part of to uh, make that possible. Um, but I don't want this to be necessarily just a pitch about this one particular uh, tool set, but overall that is something that I'm trying to uh, develop. All right, so we're talking about software management. Um, and there's a lot of focus on like, what does this look like when it comes to on the deployment side? Well, if we, too much focus there tends to create this situation where there's a difference between what this looks like on the right and as, what it looks like on the left. So I want to create a far more parity between what uh, developers are using on a day-to-day -day basis in an iterative way. Uh, in terms of how they uh, debug things and inspect things, and what they look like in production, right? As much parity as possible, right? We want these things to also compose well, right? I want to be able to have, you know, grab bags and concepts where I can take uh, a thing and merge it with another thing and actually have something usable at the end of that. I want to be able to combine features. I want to be able to combine software. I want to be able to combine libraries and modules. And so composition is important. Um, Next piece is reuse. I want to be able to reuse things. If I built something, I want to be able to reuse not just the uh, exact you know, binary at that time, but I want to be able to reuse these libraries. I want to be able to reuse, um, have the, the benefits of this. And all throughout this, we can't just forget, hey, we also need to go into deployment. So uh, let's not forget those, those needs either. So solutions. Um, I call these almost solutions because they're, they're pretty good. They usually get you most of the way. Um, but I've often found a lot of these um, sometimes lacking. So hey, containers seem to solve a lot of the problems that we have in the, the packaging world or in the software uh, world, except when they don't. Right? It's often containers provide too much isolation. So what do we do? We put something into a container, and then we break into it. Right? We try to expose all the things, we bind mount everything in, or bind mount everything out, or we start creating 
uh, network compositions in order to actually be able to interact with this thing, right? Too much isolation, right? A perfectly isolated text editor can't edit anything, right? We actually, we want our software to interact with each other. That's why we, that's why we build it. Um, and so that's even more so when the needs of a developer come into play, because I want to be able to debug things. I want to be able to look at things outside of the normal operation of that software. So isolation or too much of it can be a, uh, its own problem. Hey, uh, static binaries. This is a great tool if you have it available to you, but very often, you know, non-trivial software really re very quickly expands beyond the realm where that's a possible or uh, feasible way to, to run things. Um, it might work for one particular service, but hey, now I have several services that all have to interact. Again, I can't just say, hey, bundle this into one single little artifact that is easy for me to understand and track and manage over time. Uh, serverless, very similar sort of an issue. It's, you know, how do I, do, how do I use this locally? Um, serverless often has a, a lock-in in terms of vendors. Uh, there's sometimes a lack of standardization. Also not 100%. Uh, Self-hosting all my services, great. What if I make my you know, local environment from a developer perspective the same thing as prod? Well, now I run to sometimes issues of scale, issues of access, issues of networking. So again, we start to run into problems here. And in some sense, what we're looking for is these are all kind of approximations to this problem of being able to do packaging. And yet, this is kind of, these are ways that we avoid the need uh, for packaging itself. And um, I'm using that as the term for like the creation of these things that are reusable. So let's uh, go through kind of the, a little bit of journey of say a sample project and how this works. Um, let's start off, all right, step one. I've got nothing, I just wanna start doing development. All right, what does that mean? Hey, I want to develop on some effort. Uh, I want simple onboarding, right? That's a, a very big uh, need that we like. We want to ease development flow and be able to run uh, my local builds. I want to run my local tests, right? I'm very much focused on that kind of iterative, fast iterative, fast feedback cycle that we want to do when we want to do something uh, at not a snail's pace. I'm not going to plan out every single possible thing. I want people to be able to work. Cool. So quick iteration. That's like the primary goal here. All right. Well, at some point, um, I actually want to have more than this. I want, I want a little bit of CI. I want to say, hey, uh, I'm no longer the solar person on this. I have a team, or I have a group of people, or maybe we don't even talk to each other. We're just a distributed set of open source contributors. Now I need to do, make it so that, cool, it works for me, but what if, how do I make it so it works for everyone else? How do I make it that I can like, test this sort of thing? How do I uh, get a little more automation? Because me just pushing things manually is not going to scale forever. So here we start needing um, a little bit more CI. Right, what does this mean? Well, hey, maybe I can develop. How do I make it so others can develop, right? So we start adding you know, build tooling, start adding debuggers, scanners, linters, uh, test suites, right? This is kind of the next phase usually that we end up seeing. And now often the how it, what it takes for CI to do its job starts to be of the most importance. Um, cool, That's, that starts to be nice. Uh, what do I do next? Well. Let's get into the next section. Hey, this, uh, this is a service, it runs, it's great, it does something amazing, who, who knows what it does. But I wanna get into prod because I wanna tell the world. Cool, let's take those build artifacts that our CI produced and actually put them together. Let's stand the appropriate services that they need. They need access to the databases. They need access to um, other systems that you know, need to be up. I need to configure these things. Again, let's look at those needs, right? Usually here, the primary focus tends to be the runtime I've chosen, right? So if I'm gonna run this in a, a fly IO, I'm gonna run this in serverless, I'm gonna run this on a, on a standalone instance, I'm gonna run this in Kubernetes. At this point, that runtime orchestrator and its configuration and its needs tends to dominate the conversation. And then once this thing is in production, now I need to operate this. How do I look at it? How do I inspect it? Um, how do I fix problems? And then when there are problems, inevitably with you know, any non-trivial piece of software, uh, I want to now be able to go figure out what went wrong. So here, that ability to inspect, here, that ability to look at that runtime uh, is going to be kind of the main thing that we care about. So this is pretty good. There's uh, a whole bunch of things we, we, we did for us to get into production. Except, now what? It seems that along the way, 
uh, the needs of each of these other steps began to dominate, become, to be, become the focus. And well, what if I want to go actually still iterate on my software, right? We almost forgot the needs of that original developer, that developer environment, that fast iteration, that ability to uh, you know, get the job done and improve our software and make fixes. And this is kind of a problem I'm, I'm seeing a little bit more and more of. So how do we ensure that we don't kind of you know, lose this ability? So there's some examples. We've seen, I've seen a bunch of examples where uh, they, we say, hey, how about we make it so that that developer experience looks just like prod? Okay, so what do we do? We do, all, we do tricks like this, where we say, hey, we're gonna have our uh, runtime system uh, stand up some sort of a, a developer environment, and it'll look something like this, where, hey, it's, it's running, and then we kind of uh, give that local developer access to it. Okay, that's a way to kind of sneak in um, our, our tooling, our IDEs, our experience to look like prod because it's really just another example or instantiation of it. So that's an example of that. Uh, we have examples where, hey, uh, my local machine is basically just like a, a thin veneer over an access to something underneath the hood. Um, and that might be some service that's like spun up remotely. It starts to be managed. But again, this is a lot of machinery, a lot of machinery that looks very different than the story we started with, with that developer just being able to iterate fast and, and do their work. Now they have to use all sorts of tooling. They have to kind of sneak their way into standing up all these services or get access to these services. And we've kind of lost some of that initial uh, feel. Uh, here's another example. Very, uh, this is more like you know, VS Code style. But again, we're making a uh, deployed, in some sense, a production environment just dedicated for the purpose of that developer, and we're kind of sneaking our way in for all our development tasks to be done there. Again, it's a, it's a perfectly viable solution, but it, to me, it seems like we're kind of missing something uh, fundamental. So why are we doing this, right? All this sneaking in, like, what are we doing here? We're, we're breaking isolation first off, right? Especially as we're trying to do, use our, let's say, uh, development tools, our debuggers, our iterative tooling. We're sneaking into these containers we're making changes, and now like we're no longer, we don't want that isolation at this point. We want to be able to integrate our tool sets and our environments. Um, this is the, the, the trick we see often is, hey, let's bind mount everything in, bind mount everything out, and then like, what was the point of containerizing to begin with, is kind of what I ask. Orchestrating all of our services at some points becomes difficult. Right? I need to have um, a whole set of like either a local Kubernetes or I need to find out a way to deploy everything into a hosted one for the purpose of, hey, it's past the scale of what I can do in a local way. So why are these realms different? That's kind of the question I want to ask is why is it that we have a completely different set of toolings and different set of uh, you know, interfaces, different set of deployment strategies, depending on whether you're uh, you know, developing or depending on whether you're on the deployment side? And it seems like this is not an ideal situation, right? It's, on, for the developer, it's hard to like, bring my tooling in and do things in an, in an ad hoc manner that allows me to inspect. It's not ideal there. Not ideal for uh, operations either, right? Because you know, now that infrastructure is the only way often for them to actually be able to get their work done. So now you start kind of getting over-reliance upon that infrastructure. Um, for production, again, it's kind of weird because we want to have things that are able to uh, you know, scale, but roughly, what did we do? We just shipped our machine. It just happens to be a machine that was built for us by the, the cyborg, the, 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 the tooling. But we just shipped that coworkers, right? Our automated coworkers uh, tooling, not that of the developer. And that's probably a good thing, but now there's a bit of a disconnect. Um, not, this is not ideal for ops. Right? You can't go inspect things in the, the way you normally would. Now we have to add a whole bunch of other things, a whole bunch of other monitoring tools, a whole bunch of uh, sidecars, a whole bunch of, of uh, logging frameworks to basically give us the information that normally you would want to have in a much more native way. So it seems like there's a problem. And, uh, so why? Um, well, let's, let's figure this out. Um, our build environment, right? It depends on a container registry, all right? That's something that's kind of usually external to Git itself. Um, if we build an artifact in CI, that's nice, but the fact that we did so, or what that artifact actually is and where it's located, 
uh, that tends to be kind of start to fall out of the, the being tracked in Git model. Um, if we have uh, our pipelines, often the configuration for these pipelines starts to leak out and sneak out of the being captured in Git and is now in those uh, particular systems. That could be an issue. Um, our developer environments, right? Either we don't specify them or they're in a readme or they're like over specified and it's thou must run your developer environment using this VDI solution or this VM or inside of this container and that, that becomes over restrictive. So either we've under specified it or we've over restricted the developers. Either way, in all these situations, our iteration cycle has slowed down. All right. Um, Hey, let's go back to the original thought. Hey, Git is this great thing that allows us to track stuff. Well, let's track stuff. Okay, so we keep track of uh, build recipes, right? That's, that should be a good thing. I think this should, you know, generally this is already done. Cool, well, let's also figure out, like, let's record these build outcomes, right? Let's keep track of, like, what our infrastructure is. Here we're talking about things of, you know, you have your Terraform. Hey, you have your Terraform, you have your Helm charts. These are things that, that to specify what is the intent that I want my infrastructure to look like right now. Then when we run these things in CI, well, what actually happened? You know, there's often additional details that you get with the real world. Real world tells you, okay, yeah, this is what you wanted, here's what you got. And hopefully those are the same, but sometimes those details matter. So those things need to be recorded. Um, let's say we have our services are now running, they're live. How are those things changed, changing over time, right? There's outages, the real world actually has a, has a say. Just because something's in Git doesn't mean that's actually current reality. So let's start understanding that those external events also take place. Um, and so let's keep track of those things. Okay. Usually we call all of these things state. So we need to be really careful of where do I have state in my system. And let's uh, like actually try to minimize this. So let's try to figure out, well, can I put as much of that state as possible into something that's tracked, right? Put it in databases, put it in Git, put it somewhere where it's not gonna just disappear um, and I'm gonna have to either kind of reconstruct it or figure out or discover it again anew. Hard to do. All right, um, and this is the, you know, we wanna leverage our automation, right? This, I think the previous talk uh, was talking a lot about this, but let's keep track of um, some of the artifacts we're talking about. These are human edited. Right? These are things where a human says, I want this to exist, either this resource or this service, or here's how I want to uh, you know, build a piece of software. Then we have stuff that's more like lock files. This is stuff where we say, hey, uh, the human shouldn't keep track of these things because humans can't. We, we, we're horrible at these details. Instead, something else should kind of lock this down. And, we're, and we've started to understand that putting these into our repositories, putting these into Git tracking is helpful because you know, the humans are not as specific as our machines need to be, and therefore, let's lock these things down. State files are a very similar concept of, well, again, these are details that the humans probably don't need to necessarily track or they probably are not good at. Again, let's track these things. Let's put them into uh, uh, databases and repositories so that we know what they are. All right. But fundamentally, I want to bring up this problem of, like, we need composition, right? Um, we've kind of, seems like we've often fallen away from this. So we want to do sharing, you know, we need to kind of figure out, well, what are we trying to reuse, right? What's the simplicity we're, 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 we're aiming towards? And I, I kind of called it out like three categories of stuff that we want to be able to uh, reuse and have sharing with, right? These are recipes. So if we're talking about like the, the, the software, this is the, the build recipe for something. If this is something like infrastructure, this is your infrastructure uh, declaration, either what's in your like Terraform files, or this is what's in your like cloud formation scripts, right? Or it's in your puppet scripts. These are kind of definitions of what I want my infrastructure to look like right now. But in some sense, these are recipes. These things are stuff that anyone, anyone can rerun. That's kind of the idea. I can give this to you and then you can go build my software, or I can go give this to my CI and it can go deploy my infrastructure. Again, it's, I, I can share it, I can reuse it because other people in other contexts can make use of it. Now we get to binaries. This is kind of the, the blobs. This is, uh, let's say, a, a Docker uh, image that you push up and now is hosted in some registry. This is a uh, piece of software. Uh, this will be bundled up in various different ways, but again, it's an it's a actual binary that people are gonna be running. This, you want this to be reusable as well, 
but you're, you kind of have a different kind of reuse. You're not referring to the recipe where they're gonna go run that thing. No, um, they're not gonna rerun that thing and rebuild it. No, they're just gonna use that thing as is. They're gonna put it into some other context, into some runtime and run it. These are usually um, declared in a very like immutable sense. And then there's another type of a resource. I'm calling these snapshots for the moment, but this is a, a reference to something that can change over time, right? And as much as you, you know, we might not want this, this is the reality, right? We have a reference to a service, reference to a database, right? That database is changing all the time, and that's as intended, but that is a reference to a thing, right? Um, and that can change over time. We can snapshot this. We can try to kind of recover some aspects of reuse and sharing, but in some sense, a database in production, you're not going to necessarily, you can reuse it as it is in its current state. You're not going to be reusing all sorts of different snapshots over time, at least without, not without difficulty. So again, uh, we need to have kind of a better way to communicate these concepts, trying to figure out what the right ways are, but I want us to be able to specify in our language and in our uh, tooling, what are we reusing? Am I reusing that recipe? Am I reusing the binary exactly as is? Or am I reusing some like current snapshot or current state of something which changes over time? Um, because how we talk about them uh, will be different. And then lastly, it's, um, you know, we want things that are reusable and I kind of bundle this under the term of packaging, right? I wanna like bring back this notion of we've sidestepped this a lot, especially with uh, an overuse of like containers as the escape hatch, as the I can now package anything with this, and which is, which is true, but now it means I've lost a little bit of that reuse. I can't, uh, I can't reuse these things in the ways that you normally would want to. Uh, if you go look at you know, the standard way we build containers, it's very often uh, the beginnings of it are very package centric, right? It's I start with the distro and I'm bringing a bunch of dependencies or I'm going to build something and hey, this is defined with some sort of a, a, a package set because I, I'm in the, I don't know, the Go ecosystem. Here's all the libraries I need. Here's all the packages I need. Again, packages tend to have this composition and modularity, whereas things like these binary blobs, these containers tend to be a lot more locked in, right? They're, they're less mutable, they're less composable. So I wanna impose, now how do we do this though, right? So this is a, this is a discipline that impose, uh, you have to impose it much farther to the left, right? The, the onus is, is on the developer very often to get the packaging side of things uh, correct. This is their domain of expertise, this is their specialty. Um, so how do we make it so that when they package something, it's reusable elsewhere? Right? Let's remove sources of uncertainty. Let's remove the issues of network, my personal settings. Right? This is stuff that makes it uh, work on my machine and break on someone else's. We don't like those things. Remove those things as much as possible. Um, and we end up, hopefully, with something that is reusable. Right? I want to be able to say, uh, combine the, the, the artifacts that I have or the recipes that I have and use them everywhere. Um, again, I think that uh, you know, the, the concept here is that of be able to create something, you know, we, we call this a package, sometimes people call these modules, but something that could be reused. And that's kind of what I want to keep, uh, keep reiterating. And at the end, hey, once you have this, cool, you can compose all these things and make them enter into container-based workflows. Like, we do want to end up there because that's where all, a lot of our orchestration tools are, that's where a lot of our automations, our runtimes, that's where they want to be. Um, so we, we still want to be able to end up there. So make sure that if you do have a, a solution that allows you to do packaging, end up in, in a place where you can actually escape and, and get your, uh, um, you know, put into your runtime, make, make, your, make your operations happy. So the, the superpower I found to be able to do a lot of these things uh, has been a, a, a tool called Nix. Um, and the nice thing about this is that it allows us to package something in a way that's uh, distribution agnostic. It makes it so that I'm now isolated from my personal uh, you know, configurations. I'm isolated from a lot of these problems, but I still have the compositionality I've been looking for. Um, I don't want to go too much into this. I'd love to talk with anyone about this for as long as possible. But the point is, is that I, there are tools that can help us address these issues. And uh, we're, I'm with a company called Flocks. We're trying to bring Nix to the world. Nix is that like open source side of things. 
and I want to kind of be able to make this more uh, aware, of, uh, make it more popular. And a lot of it really comes down to this notion of make things that can be reusable. And that's kind of the thought here, is, is, is make, it, make it packaging, right? Use that same ecosystem to develop and package and, and inspect my runtime and manage my runtime. I want a consistent set of tools for this. Um, so let's see if we could kind of make that uh, a possibility. Um, a quick demonstration of what I mean by this might be in order. So I'll uh, see how much of this is helpful or useful. So uh, let's, make it better. Uh, let's say I have a piece of software. Um, in this case, uh, it's going to be really simple. It's going to be a wrapper around like Hello World. Great. What does that mean? Well, to make this reusable, I have to make it so that anyone else can run this. Usually that also means I need to be other people to develop on this. Cool, so a person shows up and goes, hey, oh great, like I don't even have a make on my machine, like that's really bad. What do I wanna do? Okay, well, let's actually get started and do some development. Cool, get started, I'm gonna get started, cool. Now I'm ready to go, I have all the tools that I need. Let's say my uh, operations department tell me I need all this stuff, everything needs to be in the right versions, I'm ready to go, cool. Now I want to build my software. Everything's been built. Let's see if it works. Great. Uh, that's exactly what my application needs to do. Um, now what? Well, I want to be able to have all this also happen in CI. Well, why can't I just have that same sequence of operations run in CI? Because CI is just like a coworker. It just happens to be a little bit faster you know, and needs less coffee. But we actually want people to be able to run through you know, builds and make things and make artifacts that are immutable in this same exact way. So cool, all right, this is now up and running. What do I wanna do next? Uh, let's see, I actually forgot my uh, own stuff, so let's see what I had next. Oh, okay, let's make a container. Cool, let's make a container out of this thing. All right, now let's uh, load that container, and now let's run that container. Cool, so what just happened here? I just said, hey, that software I just made, that package, let's bundle it up and compose it, in this case on its own, but you can imagine even combining more and more things together. Let's put this into a container, let's load it into my like current system, and let's run it. Cool, now the thing that I ran locally is exactly the same thing as I'm running in my runtime. So this ability to like translate and transform something that was locally developed on into something that I can now deploy anywhere is interesting, because that gives me the composition that I want, but also the um, similarity between my local development and my uh, runtime. That usually is a good thing. So that's uh, a piece of that. Let's see, I don't know what else I want to show here. Uh, I want to run tests. Cool. I could run this sort of a test in CI. I could have my coworker run this. Again, it shouldn't matter. Uh, what else am I doing? Oh, uh, what's actually inside this thing might be uh, of interest. Um, not a lot of stuff. Uh, in fact, it's a little bit scary with all these, uh, things, but hey, these are right now all the different dependencies I need to run, like, my little example. Cool. These are my runtime dependencies. This is essentially an S-bomb. There's, that tells you all the stuff that's up there, all the, all the pieces of software that it requires, and, like, it runs, and I'm, I'm pretty happy about it. All right. What else do we need to do? Um, we probably need to, uh, we could probably use those uh, tags, all those hashes and things to keep track of software over time. Same way we would like to keep track of like user events over time. So that's kind of like a quick exa example of, of a, a piece of this, um, just to give it a, a taste. And one moment. Maybe I've lost. So here's a question for the audience. Um, and I kind of want to know how different companies solve this problem. Uh, so when you have multiple interrelated dependencies, um, how do you manage this? There's different ways I've seen this done where you have one centralized model where this is like the one place where um, all my software gets composed. I, that's where my lock files are that declare like at this moment in time, my company's uh, view of software, of all my software stack is fully defined, fully locked down. 
Then there's also the, like, I have a bunch of independent projects, and they're all going to be operating on the, like, the trunk branch, and they're all moving along. CI is going to deploy them. They're going to run. That's an approach. Uh, we've seen leaf projects where you only have things that are in uh, as leaf dependencies. Um, so that way, they can depend on things from different moments in time, and everything kind of marches along, right? This kind of starts to decentralize things. Uh, there's also binary-driven, where I just keep a track of, like, this is my current manifest. This is the manifest of the things in production right now, and it's defined not by the, the recipes, right, what often is in my you know, Git repositories, but it's defined by here's what's in my like, registries. Here's the containers I'm currently running. You know, that becomes binary driven. Um, and so my question is actually, how do you want to do it? How do you want to manage the situation when you have lots of different pieces of software that have to be composed together, lots of different services? Um, there's not only there's a right answer here, but I'm trying to understand from people, like, what, what do they normally need? What do they normally want? What are they trying to solve? And then uh, similar to this is, like, what then do you use as your source of truth? How do you know what currently is in production? How do you know what is currently in development? What are my developers using? What are my operators using? What are my customers using? And all of it, uh, how do we make sure that we have good reuse of this stuff? Uh, so those are some, some questions. I, I want to kind of get ideas from people about that. Lastly, a uh, little bit of a plug here. Um, Flux is trying to bring uh, the superpowers of Nix to the world. Um, some of these are the kind of the problems and issues I'm thinking about, um, and uh, we're also hiring. And thank you for your uh, attention. Any questions? <laughs> yes. I can hear you. I'll just repeat. Um, you know, that block people um, from committing, you know, things that are not well formatted or not doing linting, and then we have like a developer local cluster that has an observability stack on it that people can send over OTLP their their telemetry data to do validation. You're kind of, I, I'm trying to just wrap my head around all of this, but you're essentially saying that there can be one sort of uh, holistic way to centralize a lot of these like tasks that you either see uh, on the far right or the far left of things instead of one uniform way that can be improved upon or distributed as a like sort of an organizational best practice is that sort of the idea yeah so th there should be a um, the way in which I define that developer environment right as that person's doing that should be extremely similar as what it looks like in production and so it's not going to be the same, right, because the needs of a developer are going to, going to be different. Um, but we should kind of make it as similar as possible and be able to reuse as much as possible uh, from that one context, for that developer context, and be able to use it in production and vice versa. I should be able to take something in production and then start developing on it. Okay. So, like, as a platform engineer or something, I have a backstage template that essentially encompasses a Flux uh, manifest or whatever. Developer hits self-service. They start a new project or whatever, <clears throat> commit into Git, and then use this entire workflow to get into production. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, the the key is I want to have a consistent software development lifecycle, where I can use a similar like set of tooling, a similar set of vocabulary the whole way, but rather there being a big phase shift of, oh, now I'm no longer doing local dev. Now I need to do prod, right? those needs should kind of smoothly meld into one another rather than being a complete, okay, now we did a whole new team, now we did a whole new set of requirements, now we did a whole new set of stuff. Uh, do, you, do you see a conflict for like UAT testing where you have integrations from like third party testers or uh, consumers that don't necessarily exist on the, the local dev plane but are later consumers of like uh, an environment, like a UAT environment. <clears throat> and how does Flux kind of fit into that sort of testing? I mean, if, if this is a situation where by design, it's not something that's going to, uh, you know, work on my machine and your machine and your machine and everyone's machine, right? By design, so that's a situation where we don't want that to take, take place, either because of licensing or because of costs or scale. Um, 
then at the very least, it should in principle be possible to rerun that thing, whether that's because it's making some, you know, hey, I can run an API call, maybe I don't have the keys for it. Hey, I wanna be able to uh, uh, define that when it does get into that uh, other, like, let's say scanning framework, okay, conceivably, if I had that, or I was able to run this, or I did have a remote access to it, conceivably, I could run it. I could run it upon the same artifact. I just probably can't because, well, you know, I'm not that vendor, let's say. So it's, yeah, in some cases, obviously you're not gonna have that kind of, I can run everything local, but at least in, in theory, you should be able to, and should have the tools to be able to express that. Okay, um, that's, uh, that's all I got for the moment. Uh, part of this is, like I said, I'm still trying to figure out the best way to communicate this idea, and I'm not 100% sure if, if uh, it, what the right vocabulary is, so please, um, if you have any thoughts or any ideas, or if you completely disagree, or if I just confused you, either way, uh, please say hello. My name's Tom. Have a good day.